Hi, my name is David Bruce. This is a classic samba de roda rhythm from Brazil. The shake is hit on every 16th note. This is probably how you would notate it. But if you listen carefully, you realize they're actually uneven. The third and fourth 16th note in every quarter note is slightly ahead, slightly early. Maybe it's tricky to hear it straight off. So let's take the beat, put it in some audio software and straighten it out so that all the beats fit evenly onto the 16th note grid. If we now go back to the rhythm as it's actually played, you should hear much more clearly that small hiccup the rhythm has. Here's the straight version again. And back to the original. This kind of extremely small deviation from a straight pattern has become known as micro rhythm. The difference is so small that it's quite challenging to work out what's going on. But musicologist Fabian Guyon studied a large collection of samba de roda rhythms and he found this common feature. They all played the third and fourth beats slightly early. Anyone who's trained in Western music notation, or even those of you who use the grid system of digital audio software, will tend to think in nice orderly structures, whole notes that are divided into two halves, half notes that are divided into quarters, and so on. But something like this rhythm doesn't fit into that paradigm. People sometimes say that the language you speak restricts your mode of thinking. Certain kinds of thought are just much harder in certain languages. And the same is true here. Just to show you how difficult it is, I thought I'd have a go at writing it out conventionally. I used a fast quarter note of 444, and to get a rhythm that sounded close to the groove we're looking for, I had to move that third beat a 32nd note earlier. So that's a 32nd note at quarter equals 444. Here's another example, this time from the Gnawa tradition of Morocco. So again, let's try to write that down as accurately as we can. It seems to fit somewhere between a 2 plus 1 plus 1 rhythm and a triplet. And here are two rhythms I found that are closest to the one we actually hear. Again, I used a fast quarter note to make things a little clearer. And I personally found this last one to be the nearest to the sound. It has a rhythm of 4 plus 3 plus 3. But let's just have a think about how small an interval of time we're actually talking about here. This is how fast notes at that speed go by. So we're dealing here with tiny, tiny differences. And this does leave a composer like myself who likes writing everything down with a bit of a problem because it would be extremely difficult to notate it but also extremely difficult to then play it back. That's the dilemma with these rhythms because the things you can only really pick up by being immersed in the tradition for many years. It's a, a feel or a groove. There's one example of a micro-rhythmic groove in classical music which is the Viennese waltz which famously has a slightly delayed third beat. But you could also argue that the kind of playing classical musicians use known as rubato, where different parts of the bar are stretched or squeezed to make something more expressive, is another example of micro-rhythm. In jazz and in hip-hop, you often get a kind of micro-rhythm where the beat itself is kept strictly on a grid, but the solo line drags slightly behind it. I think the first place I ever noticed something unusual was in Errol Garner's piano playing, which has these moments where the melody in the right hand drags behind the beat to give it a sort of laid back feel. There's something particularly appealing about it when the on grid rhythm and the dragged micro groove are played simultaneously by the same person. I talked a lot more about micro groove in jazz in my video on the cutting edge of jazz swing theory. This same laid back kind of idea can be found in some of D'Angelo's songs, like here in Player Player. You could almost imagine that vocal line had been recorded on the beat and then shifted in production to drag it behind the beat. So I've got one more pretty mind-blowing example to show you. 
But first, I just want to look quickly at the mention of microrhythm that cropped up in the work of one of the most popular video essayists on YouTube recently. Nerdwriter was talking about Michael Jackson's Don't Stop Till You Get Enough. Now, I'm usually a huge fan of his channel, but music theory maybe isn't his strongest suit. And in this video, there were a lot of things that were horribly wrong, chords labelled the wrong way round, talk of emphases on the one which don't really exist in this piece. But most intriguing was a reference to microrhythm and an academic paper by Anne Danielson. Jackson minimizes the distance between the beat and its syncopated sound, which comes only a handful of milliseconds before. Danielson calls this microrhythm. The beat still has funk, but it registers subconsciously, resulting in a cleaner feeling sound, something that attracts a mainstream pop audience. Now, there's clearly a smoother, less disjointed mainstream style to Don't Stop compared to some of the more syncopated James Brown tracks, but I'm not sure microrhythm has much to do with it. And this whole handful of milliseconds of syncopation Nerdwriter talks about is pretty spurious when you start looking into it, even if he does show one of those impressive looking academic charts as video essayists like to use. I looked up Danielson's paper, and what she does is compares a syncopated guitar riff in a James Brown track with a percussion sound in the Jackson that happens to come just fractionally before the beat. And she seems to use that comparison as an explanation for the more mainstream sound of the Jackson. But, well, I won't bore you with the details, but when you play the tracks side by side, she seems to be comparing two completely different things. For starters, there are guitar riffs in the Jackson which fulfill a very similar function and which would make for a much fairer comparison. Anyway, it all reminded me of the importance of critically thinking about information you receive, whether it's from an apparently authoritative video essayist, or indeed from an apparently authoritative academic article. So back to that final example. Most of the examples we've looked at so far are to do with feel that you just have to pick up over time. But it turns out that there have been attempts by musicians to understand how to create these kind of microrhythms in a way that can be understood and recreated. It's something that jazz musician Malcolm Braff has been working on. Try working out how the beat works in this duo with percussionist Stefan Galland. Banff has another track called Crimson Waves, which he talks about on his website. And he shows this as the outline of the rhythm. To be honest, looking at his website, I'm not sure I fully understood what he was talking about in terms of the harmonics of a rhythm. Although I think he was referring to the possibility of splitting a beat into multiple subdivisions, not just the standard two. But nevertheless, this rhythm itself fascinated me, and after I looked into it, I decided what's actually most interesting about it is another microrhythm beyond the complexity of what's written here. So you can see the top hand is in 11, and you can hear that very clearly on the hi-hat. As I say, this notated rhythm, despite its complexity, doesn't fully explain it. I think what's actually going on is you have these two 16th notes within the group of 11, but they're played consistently with this slight microrhythmic drag. So there's just so many layers of complexity of the rhythm here. This kind of microrhythmic feel is clearly something Braff is very involved in. He has diagrams that reference both the Brazilian and the Gnawan styles I mentioned, and he also suggests that there could be degrees of morphing, as he calls it, between a straight pattern and a morphed or swung pattern. In another piece called Good Morning Sin City, he talks about actually moving the percentage of that swing within the piece. Unfortunately, he doesn't give any explanation of how you're supposed to do this, because unlike those rhythms which form part of a culture which you learn over years, it seems like he's expecting you to make those tiny, tiny changes in microrhythm just, just like that. I did find this moment in his piece Afro Blue, which I think might be morphing in action, but I'm not totally sure. <laughs> whole area is something that Jacob Collier has been into. He gives a couple of examples of his own interpretation of the Gnawan rhythm. 
So who knows, with people like Jacob Collier and Malcolm Braff, perhaps we're looking at the first of a whole new generation of musicians who can actually think in these micro-rhythmic terms. That would be pretty exciting. So if you like this video, you can thank the people over at my Patreon page who kindly support the channel, and you're welcome to join them over there. I'll put a link to it below. But if you can't do that, that's fine as well. Just please subscribe, like, share with your friends, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.